Okay, today is 22nd of August and we've come to the 43rd chapter of the Sangyutta Nikaya called the Asangkata Sangyutta. Yesterday we read two suttas, now we come to the third, 43.3. The Buddha said, Monks, I will teach you the unconditioned and the path leading to the unconditioned. Listen to that. And what monks is the unconditioned? The destruction of lust, the destruction of hatred, the destruction of delusion. This is called the unconditioned. And what monks is the path leading to the unconditioned? Concentration with thought directed and sustained. Concentration without thought directed, without sustained only. Concentration without thought directed and sustained. This is called the path leading to the unconditioned. Uh, that's the end of the sutta. So here, concentration with thought directed and sustained, vitaka and vichara, is the first jhana. And then concentration without thought directed and sustained, that is the second jhana. So this one in between, is between the first jhana and the second jhana, it is without thought directed. Uh, you only need to sustain it. Yeah. So, you know, these uh, states of concentration, uh, different teachers uh, classify them uh, uh, differently, uh, put them under different categories. Uh. So like in the Hinduism, uh, they talk about two types of samadhi, sabhikalpa samadhi and nabhikalpa samadhi. Uh. So I'm not sure what that is. Maybe it's uh, Rupa Jhana and Arupa Jhana. So here, uh, so the Buddha says, and the path leading to the unconditioned uh, are the jhanas. Uh, so in the Buddha's uh, discourses, uh, the jhanas are very important. 43.4. This part is the same. Uh, monks, I will teach you the unconditioned and the path leading to the unconditioned. And the unconditioned is the destruction of lust, hatred and delusion. And what monks is a path leading to the unconditioned? The emptiness concentration, the signless concentration, and the undirected concentration, this is called the path leading to the unconditioned. These three uh, states of concentration uh, in Pali is called Sunyata Samadhi, the emptiness concentration, then uh, animita samadhi is the signless concentration, and then the apanihita samadhi is the undirected or desireless concentration. Earlier we read uh, that uh, when a uh, monk comes out of the state uh, called the cessation of perception and feeling, is also the cessation of consciousness. Three contacts touch him. This uh, emptiness contact, signless contact, and the undirected or desireless contact. So these uh, concentrations uh, are very high concentrations, uh, very near to the cessation of perception and feeling. That's why it's called the path leading to the unconditioned because if you attain those states, uh, you are very near to the unconditioned. And these three types of samadhi uh, are not explained actually uh, in the suttas. Uh, it's a very high state. So it's not, uh, yeah. There's only a few suttas uh, you meet this, these three concentrations and uh, they seem to be grouped together. Mm. Next sutta is 43.5. Among so tissue, the unconditioned and the path leading to the unconditioned. The unconditioned uh, is a destruction of lust, hatred, and delusion. But monks is the path leading to the unconditioned. The four satipatthanas, this is called the path leading to the unconditioned. The four satipatthanas, I like to translate it as the four intense states of recollection. Sati, later we'll come to that chapter on. Satipatthana, and then we explain more. So, the four intense states of mindfulness. 
is the path leading to the unconditioned. Mm. I think for this chapter, that's all I'm going to go through the, the suttas. Yeah. So we go to the next chapter, 44. Abhaya Kata Sangyutta discourses on the undeclared. Abhaya Kata is undeclared. It was not declared by the Buddha. 44.1 on one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Natapindika Spa. On that occasion, the nun Kema, while wandering on tour among the Kosalans, had taken up residence at Torana Vatu between Savati and Saketa. And stop here for a moment. This nun Kema uh, must be the uh, the Buddha's uh, nuns, uh, she picked two uh, uh, as the top nuns. Uh, one is for wisdom. Uh, and this nun Kema, uh, wisdom is supposed to be topmost uh, among the nuns. Uh. The other one that the uh, Buddha praised uh, was Upalavana. Upalavana was the nun uh, who was a uh, chief in uh, psychic powers uh, among all the nuns. Uh. So, uh, this uh, Kema, one day, she came to Turana Vatu uh, between Savati and Saketa. Then King Pasnadi of Kosala, while traveling from Saketa to Savati, took up residence for one night in Turana Vatu between Saketa and Savati. Then King Pasnadi of Kosala addressed a man thus, Go, good man, and find out whether there is any ascetic or Brahmin in Turana Vatu whom I could visit today. Yes, sire, the man replied. But though he traversed the whole of Torana Vatu, he did not see any ascetic or Brahmin there, whom King Pasnadi could visit. The man did see, however, the nun Kema resident in Torana Vatu. So he approached King Pasnadi and said to him, Sire, there is no ascetic or Brahmin in Torana Vatu whom your majesty could visit. This one maybe is not ascetic or Brahmin, it's ascetic or Brahmana. But Sire, there is the nun named Kema, a disciple of the Blessed One, Arahan Samasambuddha. Now a good report concerning this revered lady has spread about thus. She is wise, competent, intelligent, learned, a splendid speaker, ingenious. Let your majesty visit her. Then King Pasnadi of Kosala approached the nun Kema, paid homage to her, sat down to one side and said to her, How is it, revered lady, does the Tathagata exist after death? And she said, Great King Maharaja, the Blessed One has not declared this, that the Tathagata ex exists after death. Then, revered lady, does the Tathagata not exist after death? Great King, the Blessed One has not declared this either. The Tathagata does not exist after death. How is it then, revered lady? Does the Tathagata both exist and not exist after death? Great King, the Blessed One has not declared this. The Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death. Then, revered lady, does the Tathagata neither exist nor not exist after death? Great King, the Blessed One has not declared this either. The Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death. And the King asked, How is it, revered lady? When asked, How is it, revered lady? Does the Tathagata exist after death? And when asked, Does the Tathagata neither exist nor not exist after death? Etc. In each case you say, Great King, the Blessed One has not declared this. But now, revered lady, is the cause and reason why this has not been declared by the Blessed One. And she said, Well then, great king, I will question you about this same matter. Answer as you see fit. What do you think, great king? Do you have an accountant or calculator or mathematician who can count the grains of sand in the river Ganges? Saying thus, there are so many grains of sand, there are so many hundreds of grains of sand, or there are so many thousands of grains of sand, or there are so many hundreds of thousands of grains of sand. 
And the king said, No, revered lady. Then great king, do you have an accountant or calculator or mathematician who can count the water in the great ocean thus? There are so many gallons of water, or there are so many hundreds of gallons of water, or there are so many thousands of gallons of water, or there are so many hundreds of thousands of gallons of water. No, revered lady, for one reason, because the great ocean is deep, immeasurable, hard to fathom. And she said, So too, great king, that form by which one describing the Tathagata might describe him has been abandoned by the Tathagata, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, obliterated so that it is no more subject to future arising. The Tathagata, great king, is liberated from reckoning in terms of form or body. He is deep, immeasurable, hard to fathom like the great ocean. The Tathagata exists after death, does not apply. The Tathagata does not exist after death, does not apply. The Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death, does not apply. The Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death, does not apply. Similarly, the feeling by which one in describing the Tathagata might describe him, that perception, that volition, that consciousness by which one describing the Tathagata might describe him, has been abandoned by the Tathagata, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, obliterated so that it is no more subject to future arising. The Tathagata, great king, is liberated from reckoning in terms of body, feeling, perception, volition and consciousness. He is deep, immeasurable, hard to fathom like the great ocean. The Tathagata exists after death, does not apply. The Tathagata does not exist after death, does not apply. The Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death, does not apply. The Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death, does not apply. Stop here for a moment. So, usually uh, the Buddha's disciples, uh, they will say uh, that the Buddha cannot be described as the body or the feeling or perception or volition or consciousness. And then they don't want to say that uh, there is no Tathagata, uh, that uh, it is like he is here and they say uh, the Buddha is uh, deep, immeasurable, hard to fathom like the great ocean. This is because uh, when the Buddha has passed into Parinibbana, uh, he has gone to the unconditioned. Nibbana is the unconditioned. And the unconditioned, the unborn, is hard to fathom, is deep, immeasurable. Then King Pasnadi of Kosala, having delighted and rejoiced in the nun Bhikkhema statement, rose from his seat, paid homage to her and departed, keeping her on his right. Then on a later occasion, King Pasnadi of Kosala approached the Blessed One. Having approached, he paid homage to the Blessed One and sat down to one side and said to him, How is it, Venerable Sir, does the Tathagata exist after death? And the Buddha said, Great King, I have not declared this. The Tathagata exists after death. And similarly he asked, Then does the Tathagata not exist after death? And again the Buddha said he has not declared this. And then he says, and does the Tathagata both exist and not exist after death? And the Buddha said, I have not declared this. And finally he says, Then does the Tathagata neither exist nor not exist after death? And the Buddha said, Great King, I have not declared this either. The Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death. And the King asked, How is this, Venerable Sir? When asked, How is it, Venerable Sir, does the Tathagata exist after death? Does the Tathagata not exist after death? Does the Tathagata both exist and not exist after death? Does the Tathagata neither exist nor not exist after death? In each case you say, Great King, I have not declared this. But now, Venerable Sir, is the cause and reason why this has not been declared by the Blessed One. And the Buddha said, Well then, Great King, I will question you about this same matter. Answer as you see fit. What do you think, Great King? 
Do you have an accountant or calculator or mathematician who can count the grains of sand in the river Ganges does? There are so many grains of sand, there are so many hundreds or so many thousands or so many hundreds of thousands of grains of sand. And he said, no, no, rebel sir. And then the Buddha asked again, then great king, do you have an accountant or calculator or mathematician who can count the water in the great ocean does? There are so many gallons of water in the ocean or so many hundreds of gallons or so many thousands of gallons or so many hundreds of thousands of gallons in, of water in the ocean. And he said, no, Rebel Sir. For what reason? Because the great ocean is deep, immeasurable, hard to fathom. And the Buddha said, so too, a great king, that form by which one describing the Tathagata might describe him has been abandoned by the Tathagata cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, obliterated, so there is no more subject to future arising. The Tathagata, a great king, is liberated from reckoning in terms of body or form. He is deep, immeasurable, hard to fathom like the great ocean. The Tathagata exists after death, does not apply. The Tathagata does not exist after death, does not apply. The Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death, does not apply. The Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death, does not apply. Similarly, the feeling, perception, volition and consciousness uh, by which one describing the Tathagata might describe has been abandoned by the Tathagata, cut off at the root, etc. Similarly, the Buddha said uh, the Tathagata is deep, immeasurable, hard to fathom. And then the uh, king said, this wonderful verbal sir, it is amazing verbal sir, how the meaning and phrasing of both teacher and disciple coincide and agree with each other and do not diverge. That is in regard to the chief matter. On one occasion, verbal sir, I approached the nun Kema and asked her about this matter. The revered lady explained this matter to me in exactly the same terms and phrases that the Blessed One used. It is wonderful, Venerable Sir. It is amazing, Venerable Sir, how the meaning and the phrasing of both teacher and disciple coincide and agree with each other and do not diverge. That is, in regard to the chief matter. Now, Venerable Sir, we must go. We are busy and have much to do. And the Buddha said, Then, great king, you may go at your own convenience. The king, Pasnadi of Posala, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's statement, rose from his seat and paid homage to him, and departed, keeping him on his right. It's the end of the sutta. This is not the only sutta where the Buddha and his disciples say exactly the same thing. There's some other suttas or so. Huh? Maybe it's because uh, the Buddha can read his mind. So when he came to ask the Buddha this question, uh, the Buddha already read his mind uh, that this he had already asked. The nun came out before, huh? so the Buddha purposely answered him exactly the same way. The next sutta is 44.2. This 44.2 uh, is found at page 936. This sutta is in the Kanda Sangyutta. And when we went through the Kanda Sangyutta, I did not read this sutta, although it's quite good, nah, because uh, it's quite similar to the other suttas. Nah. So if I read too many of them, nah, it will be boring for you. But now, we can read it like, because it's quite good. This sutta is 44.2. It's exactly the same as 22.86. On one occasion, the Blessed One was dwelling at Vesali, in the great wood in the hall with the peak roof. Now on that occasion, the Venerable Anuradha was dwelling in a forest hut not far from the Blessed One. Then a number of wanderers of other sects approached the Venerable Anuradha and exchanged greetings with him. When they had concluded their greetings and cordial talk, they sat down to one side and said to him, Friend Anuradha, when a Tathagata is describing a Tathagata, the highest type of person, the supreme person, the attainer of the supreme attainment, he describes him in terms of these four cases. The Tathagata exists after death. Or the Tathagata does not exist after death. Or the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death. Or the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death. 
And this was said, the member Anuradha said to those wondrous friends, when a Tathagata is describing a Tathagata, the highest type of person, the supreme person, the attainer of the supreme attainment, he describes him apart from these four cases. The Tathagata exists after death, or the Tathagata does not exist after death, or the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death, or the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death. When this was said, those wanderers said to the venerable Anuradha, This monk must be newly ordained, not long gone for, or if he is an elder, he must be an incompetent fool. Then those wanderers of other sects, having denigrated the venerable Anuradha with terms, with the terms newly ordained and fool, rose from the seats and departed. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So these wanderers, uh, they are not familiar with the Buddha's teachings. So they thought uh, that the Buddha uh, says like that when describing the, the Tathagata, the Buddha, that the Buddha exists after death or does not exist or both exist and uh, neither exists, etc. But uh, this uh, Anuradha says uh, uh, that is not the case. Like, the Buddha never used these four terms like, to describe the Buddha. So they thought that uh, this member Anuradha must be a fool or just one forth. Like. Then not long after those wanderers had left, it occurred to the member Anuradha, if those wanderers of other sects should question me further, how should I answer if I am to state what has been said by the Blessed One? and not misrepresent him with what is contrary to fact. And how should I explain in accordance with the Dhamma, so that no reasonable consequence of my assertion would give grounds for criticism? Then the Venerable Anuradha approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side, and reported to the Blessed One everything that had happened, asking, If those wanderers of other sects should question me further, how should I answer so that no reasonable consequence of my assertion would give grounds for criticism? And the Buddha said, What do you think, Anuradha? Is body or form permanent or impermanent? And he said, Impermanent, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent, suffering or happiness? And he said, Suffering, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent, suffering, subject to change, fit to be regarded as, This is mine. This I am, this is myself. And he said, no, Venerable Sir. Similarly, is feeling permanent or impermanent? Is perception, volition, consciousness permanent or impermanent? And he said, impermanent, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent, suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir. Is what is impermanent, suffering and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. No, Venerable Sir. Therefore, Anuradha, any kind of body or form whatsoever, whether past, future or present, any feeling, any perception, any volition, any consciousness whatsoever, whether past, future or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all aggregates should be seen as they really are, with correct wisdom thus, this is not mine, this I am not. This is not myself. Seeing thus, Anuradha, the learned noble disciple experiences revulsion towards body, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. Experiencing revulsion, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it is liberated. He understands, destroyed his birth, the holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more for this state of being. He asked, What do you think, Anuradha? Do you regard body as a Tathagata? Do you regard feeling, perception, volition, consciousness as the Tathagata? And he said, No, Venerable Sir. What do you think, Anuradha? Do you regard the Tathagata as in the body? He said, no, Venerable Sir. Do you regard the Tathagata as apart from body? No, Venerable Sir. Similarly, do you regard the Tathagata as feeling or perception or volition as consciousness? And he said, no, Venerable Sir. 
and you regard the Tathagata as apart from these aggregates, no available sir. What do you think, Anuradha? Do you regard body, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness taken together as a Tathagata? And he said, no available sir. What do you think, Anuradha? Do you regard the Tathagata as one who is without body, without feeling, without perception, without volition, without consciousness? No available sir. But Anuradha, when the Tathagata is not apprehended by you as real and actual here in this very life, is it fitting for you to declare, Friends, when the Tathagata is describing a Tathagata, he describes him apart from these four cases. The Tathagata exists after death, does not exist, both exist and does not exist, neither exists nor does not exist. I said, no, Rebbe, sir. Good, good, Anuradha. Formerly, Anuradha, and also now, I make known just suffering and the cessation of suffering. It's the end of the sutta. So here, first, the Buddha goes through that standard uh, questioning uh, that the five aggregates are permanent or impermanent, and he says, impermanent. And what is impermanent? Uh, is suffering or happiness, and he says, uh, suffering. Uh, so what is impermanent suffering subject to change huh? should not be regarded as this is mine, this I am, this myself. Huh? Hmm. Therefore, huh, all uh, aggregates whatsoever, past, present, future, huh, should be seen as they really are huh, with wisdom. Huh? Uh, this is not I, this is not mine, etc. Huh? And seeing thus, huh, the Noble disciple uh, experiences revulsion or disenchantment with the five aggregates. Uh, and experiencing revulsion or disenchantment, uh, he becomes dispassionate uh, and from dispassion uh, becomes liberated. Then he asks, uh, is the five aggregates, uh, uh, the Tathagata, the Buddha, uh, has to say no. And then, do you regard the the Tathagata as inside the five aggregates. And he said, no. Do you regard the Tathagata as outside the five aggregates, apart from the five aggregates? Again, he says, no. And then do you regard the five aggregates together as the Tathagata? But since the five aggregates are impermanent, they cannot be the Tathagata. So he says, no. And do you regard the Tathagata as one without the five aggregates? Again, no. So the Buddha says, uh, in this very life, uh, when the Tathagata is alive, uh, something that is, even when the, the Buddha is alive, uh, that uh, which you can describe uh, is the Buddha. Uh. There's no one thing uh, that you can describe is the Buddha. Because uh, the five aggregates uh, that are supposed to be the Buddha, uh, they are all impermanent. So there's no single thing uh, that you can point to uh, as the Buddha. Uh, so that is the that being the case, uh, in, even in this very life, uh, you cannot find such a thing uh, that you can call the Buddha. It's just a flux of conditions. Uh, so how can you talk about him after death? Uh? So here, uh, the Buddha goes into describing this, uh, the Buddha or the Tathagata in terms of the five aggregates. Uh, and tries to make a person see yeah, that uh, the five aggregates is not the Buddha. And yet, uh, you cannot say that the Buddha has no five aggregates. Uh. And then, uh, if you analyze one by one, uh, you find uh, there's, uh, there's no one thing uh, that you can call the Buddha, uh, even when he is alive. Uh. So this is a different approach uh, from the previous one. The previous sutta we read, uh, the Buddha doesn't want to go into all this detail. Uh, he just says uh, that uh, the Tathagata is deep, uh, unfathomable, uh, hard to understand, uh, hard to fathom. Uh, so, but this one is very different. This one goes into the five aggregates in detail. Mm. This type of suttas, uh, uh, I mean, reading it is one thing, uh, but really seeing it, uh, you need a very clear mind uh, to see and, and become enlightened. But it is this type of suttas that the 
Buddha's disciples, uh, after they attain the four jhanas, uh, they listen to this type of suttas uh, and actually become enlightened. Uh. So I would consider uh, this type of suttas uh, are very important, but a lot of uh, vipassana followers, uh, they say the most important sutta that the Buddha taught uh, is the Maha Satipatthana Sutta. But I never seen in the suttas uh, anybody listen to the Satipatthana Sutta and became enlightened. Not a single person, uh, Buddha's disciples, uh, listened to the Satipatthana or the Maha Satipatthana Sutta and became enlightened. This, these type of suttas, uh, when you analyze the aggregates in detail, uh, they become enlightened. So these type of suttas are much more important.